jellyfish. At the mere mention of the name, most of us imagine shapeless, rubbery and even disgusting creatures. In any case, there's something we do not wish to touch. It isn't until we see them underwater that they transform into graceful beings. In the course of evolution, jellyfish have developed unbelievably clever skills and have conquered every habitat in our oceans. To protect themselves, they've developed weapons that can also become dangerous to humans. Most jellyfish are not a threatened species. In the large family of jellyfish, this box jellyfish is the most dangerous. Closely followed by this siphonophore, the Portuguese man of war. For most of us, the word jellyfish evokes negative feelings. The term medusas is more appropriate and it gives it the feel of a mysterious and dangerous beauty. This is Dr. Gerhard Jams, one of the most knowledgeable experts on medusas. He will be introducing us to the unusual life cycle of these animals. A beach in Eckenförde on the Baltic coast. Numerous aurelias have been washed ashore. Touching? No problem. Aurelias do not sting. For these two young boys, the jellyfish are a welcome change from their boring sun tanning monotony. Gerhard Jarms on the creation and development of medusas. Most people feel disgusted by these animals, but in reality they are smooth, soft and what's even more interesting, their history goes back 500 million years. During this time they have developed the most fascinating shapes and most interesting lifestyles. They live both in the deep sea and here on the Baltic coastline. If we ignore for a moment the massive influxes of medusas on the coasts of the North Sea and Baltic Sea from time to time, the oceans are not necessarily packed with medusas, even if these images make it look that way. Where do medusas come from? How and where do they reproduce? The life cycle of jellyfish or medusas is characterized by a shift from one generation to the next and by a change between the sessile and the free swimming states. These aurelias have separate males and females, but their young are quite unique. The female distributes tiny larvae in the water and they then attach themselves to anything suitable. These tiny eight-armed discs, which are trying to free themselves from a sessile polyp with all their might, are tiny medusas. But before they get to this point, about 14 days have passed and this polyp originally looked quite different. Recording this process requires sophisticated technology and filming techniques. Yams documents the individual stages with an endo camera in his laboratory at the Zoological Institute of Hamburg University. The original medusa larvae have produced a polyp which bears no relation to medusas at all. By the way, the sole purpose of this polyp is to catch food. Not until the polyp colony has reached an optimum state of nutrition can the separation process begin. The polyps have changed completely and now look like little fir cones. The separation process of the tiny medusas is called strobulation, which comes from the Greek for fir cone. These tiny disks will later develop into large medusas, but only around 1% of them will survive. The rest will become prey. These tiny medusas are already perfectly equipped. Between the tiny arms, they have a number of different sensory organs with which they can see, taste and also control their position in the water. The gelatinous animals consist of 98% water. The life cycle of a medusa can be from 1 to 30 years, depending on the species. During this time, they can grow up to 200 times their initial size. But there are also others that like to feed on plankton, basking sharks, for example.
Just like the Aurelias, these 10 meter long sharks prefer animal plankton that they filter through their giant gills. The Aurelias are also part of the menu of the basking sharks. The more, the better. The sharks have competition. The lion's main medusa has long stinging tentacles and it has already stored a bunch of prey, Aurelias. It's doubtful whether this lion's mane would even be digestible by the sharks. Many medusa researchers consider this to be the most beautiful of all jellyfish, the crowned medusa. There's no doubt that researching this creature is one of the most expensive projects in marine zoology. This medusa lives in great depths. In order to find these crown jewels of all marine research subjects, we have to travel to Norway, 25 kilometers north of Bergen, to the Lura Fjord. Haken Mosby, a Norwegian research vessel famous for spectacular discoveries. An ROV is being launched in the waters of the Lura Fjord. It's a sophisticated remote operated vehicle equipped with cameras, lights and collection bins. seen through the eyes of the underwater robot. The ROV will dive to several hundred meters. This whole exercise has one objective, to find Perifilla Perifilla, which is the Latin name for the crowned Medusa. 1,000 watt xenon spotlights brighten up even the dark, ice-cold waters of the Lura Fjord. The descent has started. This is the control room. The ROV is being completely controlled from here. This acrylic tube, which is attached to the robot, is part of a vacuum pump. The scientists want to try and catch Perifilla, but it's not that easy. The skill of the ROV operator is crucial. These mysterious medusas live at great depths, around a thousand meters out in the open ocean. But now scores of them have entered the Norwegian fjord and are destroying all life there. They don't feed on fish, but on their larvae. These medusas are reported to reach the biblical age of 30 years. ROV operator Asger Steinsland is a master in handling this heavy machine. He switches the spotlights off. Perifilla appears as a grand firework with lights flashing everywhere. It possesses the ability of bioluminescence, a characteristic known in numerous deep sea creatures. Lights on. As of yet, we don't know exactly why this jellyfish is red. But Yarms can answer what the bioluminescent signals mean. The only explanation we can find for these lighting effects is that they're a defense against predators and a form of camouflage in this exceedingly dark, deep habitat. If a predator touches the medusa, it reacts spontaneously with a bright, sudden yellow flash of light, which might frighten off the enemy. If that doesn't work, and the enemy touches it again, the medusa contracts convulsively, while at the same time sending out myriads of tiny, brightly luminescent particles, which diffuses the outline of the jellyfish and makes it undetectable. Just after midnight in the control room. This is the time when Perifilla ventures into shallower waters. The chances are in our favor. The first medusa disappears up in the suction tube. It's possible to catch them in nets, but they will be dead before they got to the surface. 5 a.m. The robot is brought back on board. Marine research is expensive, which is why researchers work around the clock. The ROV went to 300 meters and the team is excited to see the living specimens. At this point, nobody has an explanation for this mass invasion into certain fjords. Twelve live Perifilla medusas have come on board. Expedition leader Ulf Bamsted is pleased. Each of the members of this international crew wants one of the specimens for their own research. Gerhard Jams is one of the lucky ones but he can't spend too long examining it. 
In the light, the red pigment is rapidly converting. It begins to dissolve the medusa, making holes in its bell. The animal dies very quickly. A surprise. This crab is eating the gelatinous outer skin of the medusa. A jellyfish paradise in its own right sits in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean around the Azores. Our destination is the island of Pico in the west of the archipelago. The Azores are of volcanic origin. This group of islands is part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the geological spreading zone that pulls Europe and Africa further apart from America. Climate and weather are determined by the Gulf Stream, which bathes the Azores in tropical warm water from the Gulf of Mexico. The ocean around the archipelago is teeming with many marine mammals and large fish like no other place in the world. Between the months of March and April, 24 different whale species appear around Pico, looking for plankton, which is in great abundance during that time. Dolphins don't only hunt for fish, but also squid, which sometimes come up to the surface in large numbers, but these dolphins are just playing. Pilot whales also love squid. An adult pilot whale can grow up to eight meters, and feed on about 50 kilograms of squid per day, or more accurately, per night. These sunfish are also interested in softer food. They love to feed on all kinds of jellyfish. The beach on Pico also offers great opportunities for jellyfish connoisseurs. These netted dog whelks, a type of sea snail, feed on the most dangerous ocean inhabitants in the world. The snail moves quickly. It has no problems with the deadly tentacles. This Portuguese man of war is not a true jellyfish, but a colony of polyps. It drifts through the world's oceans with a gas-filled float. Each polyp has a specific task assigned to it. They would not be able to survive on their own. A loggerhead turtle poses real danger to siphonophores. They will not only feed on the harmless moon jellies, but also the poisonous polyp colonies. It seems possible to fill up on one of these marine jello puddings. A giant whale shark also takes advantage of the large abundance of food off the coast of Pico. The largest fish in the ocean, it can grow up to 14 meters and filters small fish like sardines and anchovies and plankton out of the water with its large mouth. This friendly giant is not dangerous to people. A mobula manta also picks up a bite of sardines, otherwise it too feeds on plankton. Especially younger ones love to school. The rolled up skin flaps seem like little horns and give these animals a demon-like look, which is why they're also referred to as devilfish. Underwater, the Azores consist mainly of holes, just like a Swiss cheese. Countless caves go all through the lava rock, which offers great habitats for many marine creatures. During our first dive, we encounter Pelagia noctiluca, commonly referred to as the mauve stinger. It won't light up unless touched or during the night. The Pelagia noctiluca can leave very painful injuries. These jellies are often the scourge of beachgoers. We don't know why this school of jellies stays in the cave. Maybe they drifted in here, or are they seeking cover from the rough seas? 
The next day, the animals leave the netherworld of Pico again. And whoever doesn't make it out in time will fall prey to these bristle worms that are lurking around waiting for jellies to get caught. They love this jello-like ocean inhabitant. We're going deeper into the cave and find thousands of cave shrimp. They avoid light at all cost. Here they're being hassled by a physid hake. In this light, it becomes clear how fragile these shrimp are. Their long antennae allow them to find their way in this dark environment, and they feel safest in large numbers. The more members they have in their group, the safer it is for each of them. This Pelagia noctiluca is a successful hunter, and several small crustaceans have fallen prey to the jelly's appendages. The nerve poison has an immediate effect. Directly under the surface, myriads of mini medusas are drifting by, either towards death or adulthood. Many of them will end in the bellies of loggerhead turtles. Is it a jelly chain? No, it's a colony of Thaliacea. They're not jellyfish, but astonishingly are more closely related to vertebrates, even us. Pelagia noctiluca is also looking for plankton, just like the Thaliacea. But this lion's mane is relatively harmless in comparison with this Portuguese man of war. These jellies can't dive, but they can sail and cover thousands of kilometers this way. But that's also a weakness, as they often drift ashore. It catches its prey with its deadly weapons immediately below the ocean surface. The sail is both a drawback and an advantage. A school of fish can be reached quickly, and it carries an armada of stinging appendages which can be extended up to 10 meters. The Portuguese man of war will fire off whole batteries of stinging cells at its victims. It's clearly visible that the Medusa stockpiles food, which is essential because there are often days where the hunt yields nothing at all. The poison injected into the Portuguese man of war's victims can be compared to a powerful snake venom. Dramatic accidents with bathers are frequent. This girl is in great danger. The Medusa reacts automatically to physical contact and fires off highly poisonous tentacles and capsules at its prey. Medical help is urgently required. This character is not bothered at all by deadly venom. It gobbles it up. It needs it. Glaucus atlanticus is a small sea snail and a champion venom eater. It actually reuses the jellyfish venom for its own protection, storing the venom in its dorsal appendages. The more venom the man of war fires off, the better. But they also have enemies. Apart from the Glaucus atlanticus, there are fish and turtles that feed on these jellies. Storms, the biggest threat for siphonophores. Once they're stranded, an armada of snails will soon be there to feed on them. Hardly anyone is as well informed about these poisonous sailors as Gerhard Jams. The term siphonophore or colonial jelly implies a number of beings. The colony consists of members that contribute the float sail and polyps, as well as the ones that fulfill all the other functions necessary for survival. These animals have to develop very powerful venom as they can't pursue their prey. They can only drift on the wind that fills their sail. These colonial jellies are not only found in the Atlantic, they can also drift into the Mediterranean Sea. The sun plays a vital role in the life of these jellies and is crucial for their existence. 
Reason enough to go and check out a place where we will find an abundance of sunshine. The waters around the archipelago of Palau in the South Sea. Palau is part of Micronesia in the Southern Pacific Ocean. This island group is of volcanic origin and surrounded by massive coral atolls. Only 11 of the 357 islands are inhabited. Our destination is the island of Mechakar, which has a saltwater lake completely isolated from the waters of the adjacent lagoon. This is the lake, and it holds a secret. It's a prime example of evolution. Hundreds of thousands of rhizostome jellyfish live here, of which none has ever seen the ocean. Plankton is missing in this lake, so they live off sunshine. Inside the body of these jellyfish are thousands of single-cell algae. These algae make use of the sunlight to generate glucose via photosynthesis, a remarkable cooperation between jellies and algae, which is the result of a catastrophe. At some point in its history, during a volcanic eruption, this lake became isolated from the ocean. All that was left were the medusas. Thanks to their asexual reproduction, thousands of new generations have developed since. As long as they're drifting in the open water, these medusas have no natural predators. But down at the bottom of the lake, there are anemones attached to old tree branches that act as the health police. They use their tentacles to catch the weaker and older medusas. We are leaving the warm waters of the South Pacific and moving on to colder waters off the west coast of Canada. Our destination is Hearst Island in the Vancouver Strait off Vancouver Island. The vessel Shallon is cruising off Sarnich Inlet. On board are biologists from Victoria. Vancouver Island is a haven for nature. Large colonies of seals inhabit the numerous surrounding islands. The proximity of the mainland is deceptive. The water here is no less than 70 meters deep. The area the divers are interested in is an unusual reef in 50 meters. The waters around Vancouver Island are cold and rich in nutrients, an absolute paradise for medusas. The diversity of comb jellies is noticeable, their gelatinous transparent bodies drifting through the dark green water. An encounter of an unusual kind. This is not a medusa, but a hooded sea snail. It's on the lookout for a new location, a habitat with strong currents where it can find plankton. And the search does not take long. It shovels large quantities of anything edible into its enormous mouth. This pattern reminds us immediately of a compass, Compass jellyfish are probably the classic image we have of what a jellyfish should look like. It would definitely win a beauty contest. Going deeper and deeper, now at 30 meters. The lion's mane, or hairy stinger, has a thousand tentacles under its bell and grows up to two meters in diameter. The large bell is divided into eight segments. Scars are visible, probably from swimming crabs that nibbled on the jellyfish. Although the lion's mane has a powerful sting and its tentacles are always ready to catch prey, there are some fish that seek shelter in between the tentacles during their adolescent stage. In this case, it's a group of young cod that are skillfully avoiding the stinging tentacles. The team continues their descent following the lion's mane. A wolf eel shows its teeth. This encounter is harmless. The animal is only interested in our camera.
Wolf eels are ground dwellers. They do not have a swim bladder and only snake their way through the water for short distances. It's nice to have an experienced hand as one gets to know one another. This chimera floats elegantly through the water. It's related to rays. This wolf eel is especially friendly. It shows off its tender side because it can easily crack shells and likes to feed on lobster. The eel enjoys the warmth of the diver's exposed hands. At a depth of 48 meters, we reach the Genarius Reef. These are not cold water corals. They're enormous glass sponges with a skeleton consisting of millions of silica needles. There are only a few places in the world where these glass sponges are found at a relatively shallow depth. They're mostly found in deeper habitats at about a thousand meters. This red cone jelly too usually lives at greater depth. A benthocodon also joins the party. They're no less beautiful than the glass sponges. Comb jellies are the neon advertising signs of the oceans. The iridescent light effect is generated by fine hairs. The presence of the glass sponges and jellyfish is evidence of a powerful tidal current at this depth, transporting large amounts of nutrients. Its beauty can hardly be surpassed, but the berrowy is a dangerous predator, as we shall soon see. We have ascended into shallower areas and discovered something unusual. Despite its formidable weapons, a lion's mane jelly has become caught in a hopeless situation. These two lion's manes are in for a similar fate. The way down is a dangerous one. There are plenty of dahlia anemones waiting to feed. This one has not yet picked up its Sunday lunch. At the moment, it has a fairly frugal lifestyle, living off copepods in the plankton by pulling them towards its mouth with its tentacles. This neighbor is more successful. The medusa is desperately trying to escape the tentacles of its predator, but the jelly's fate has been sealed. After several hours, only the leftovers of the lion's mane jelly are protruding from the greedy mouth of the dahlia anemone. Not far away, several sea lions have appeared. This bull is watching over its harem, fairly relaxed and at a distance. His females are comfortably stretched out on the exposed sandbank. They have no interest in the countless fish surrounding them. They're ready to take a nap. A relaxing back massage or just lounging. Pleasant alternatives to lying around on land in full sun. It's nice and cool in the shallow water near the beach. The chief is also enjoying himself. His ladies are content and there's no other male in sight. It's evening in Sarnich Inlet. Experts in this region know that this is the most beautiful time of the day. As darkness falls, the great feast will begin. Plankton will start to rise from great depths to the surface. Innumerable tiny aurelias hunt microscopically small creatures in the darkness of the night. The large moon jellies also take part in the feast. This little cubozoan has an edge over others during the hunt. It has perfected the skill of jetting backwards. For a jellyfish, that's incredibly fast. Where there are medusas, there are also thaliacea. Every single animal in this chain is hungry.
Not every visitor on this nighttime feast is interested in the smaller creatures. This sea gooseberry is in the process of eating a relative very rarely seen. The night in Sarnich Inlet ends with a tremendous fireworks show. Comb jellies of unimaginable shapes have taken over the nighttime stage while feeding on plankton. Every change in direction produces a glowing stream of bright lights, like the colourful displays at a Christmas market. To find another curiosity in the Medusa family, we travel to a remote area of Indonesia, Raja Ampat in northwestern West Papua. This archipelago consists of around 1,500 islands, of which only very few are inhabited. The few people who live here don't have a major influence on the environment, not yet at least. But Raja Ampat has become well known. With his outrigger boat, this fisherman slowly glides over a natural treasure, which is not found in many other places in the world. More than 500 different coral species have settled here in the clear waters of Raja Ampat. This lush, soft coral colony catches plankton with its many tentacles. These batfish enjoy the current, one of the 1,300 different fish species in the archipelago. Masters of camouflage, two ghost pipefish, distant relatives of seahorses, imitate algae, moving back and forth in the current. Also a master of blending in, a carpet shark, only easy to spot when it swims. Mantas also treasure the rich abundance of food that the island paradise has to offer. The giant rays are on the lookout for cleaner fish, but currently their cleaning personnel are busy elsewhere. And then finally we find the curious misfits that we are searching for, upside down jellyfish. It looks like gelatinous cauliflower, but is the underside of a jellyfish that has its mouth upward towards the sunlight. The tentacles contain important algae. Upside down jellies are stuck to the ocean floor with their bell and pump plankton rich water towards their tentacles. They are not good swimmers and they will only swim if absolutely necessary. Here in the dense mangrove forests of Raja Ampat, we are looking for the nursery of these peculiar jellyfish. Without a guide, it will be impossible to find our way back out of this maze of canals, bays and twists and turns. The upside down jellies are born right here, protected by the mangrove roots. A mat of polyps. This is where baby jellyfish bud off from their polyps. The colony of sessile polyps will soon see a chain reaction. Once one polyp begins to bud, others soon follow. These jellyfish have two ways of gathering food. Either they wave their tentacles around to draw plankton in towards their mouths, or they make use of the single-celled algae that live inside the jellyfish and generate energy for them from the sunlight. While some are simply peculiar, others are very dangerous. On our search for one of the most feared jellies, we are travelling to the northeastern coast of Australia. 
in Townsville, we're hoping to learn the latest research regarding the infamous box jelly, also called the sea wasp. We're meeting up with Gerhard Jams again, who is here to find out more about this highly poisonous jellyfish. Jams has spent hundreds of hours at the microscope researching the secrets of this jellyfish. He was one of the first to document the entire life cycle of this most dangerous of all medusas. Jellyfish have sensory cells whose internal workings can only be examined with a microscope. One of these organs is the eye, of which the deadly sea wasp has several. And this is what a deadly sea wasp looks like. It's one of the most venomous creatures in the ocean. Contact with its tentacles causes death within a short period of time unless there is medical help close by. From October to May, all the beaches here and to the north are closed. Swimming and bathing is only permitted in the areas that are completely enclosed. Here they call this little monster the box jelly. White-skinned people are at greatest risk. People with darker skin or the local Aborigines are better off. They're less likely to come into contact with a box jelly. The following pictures will explain why. The eyes of the deadly medusa are a key factor. They're hardly visible, embedded in special sensory niches. Only if magnified 50 to 100 times are they identifiable as eyes. In the murky water, the body of the white girl is hardly noticeable, but the dark-skinned body is much easier to see. The medusa is able to detect these different levels of contrast. For the box jelly, this does not appear to be prey and it changes course. It will not have to wait long for prey though. This fish has come along just in time. But why are there so many deadly sea wasps here at this time of year? The reason is their life cycle. By October, the growing medusas have reached a size that is already very dangerous for swimmers. In the following May, this generation of jellyfish will die off. A lab in Cairns. Jamie Seymour is a biologist and knows the deadly box jelly like no other. For many years, the scientist has been studying these beautiful monsters. The box jelly lives on fish and therefore needs very powerful venom. He wants to show us, under the microscope, the full range of weapons available in this Medusa's arsenal. Along the arms, we see lateral ridges which contain masses of tightly arranged nematocysts, four to five thousand of them. The stings on the legs of the young girl would have caused death if she had not been treated immediately. The ugly scars will remain for life. The Australians themselves know full well what the warnings mean. Careless tourists who stray outside the fenced-off bathing areas are usually the ones that put themselves in danger. But then there are others who are not afraid of the risks. This is Jamie Seymour's staff. Protected by neoprene suits, they're trying to gather as much information as possible about the life and habits of the box jelly. However, it's difficult and dangerous to observe these deadly jellyfish in their murky habitat, which is why the scientists have to catch enough specimens for their research. Catching them is not particularly difficult because box jellies are usually found close to the surface. Yams can't complain about not having enough jellies. Back to the US again, this time to the east coast off Cape Hatteras in North Carolina. The Seaward Johnson one of the research vessels of Harvard Branch, the renowned oceanographic institution, is anchored off the Cape where the Gulf Stream leaves the US continent and heads towards Europe. We're going to search for the mysterious and lesser known deep sea jellyfish with the Johnson Sea Link submarine.
Pilot Phil Santos has his own routine in handling this sophisticated high-tech system. The Johnson ceiling can dive down to 1,200 meters. During our descent, the first wondrous creature appears, probably a comb jelly which is part of the family of siphonophores. A berroi. Phil Santos prepares the low light camera in order to observe a unique deep sea phenomenon. Lights out and it begins. At this depth, underneath the Gulf Stream, where the warm and cold water currents begin to mix, we find a sparkly world. In this darkness, many animals have their own lights. They possess different forms of bioluminescence. The viper fish can also create light. This lonely predator can switch on up to 1,500 biological light bulbs. The jelly's light is cold light. During this highly efficient biochemical process, no energy is lost to the creation of warmth. The ability to create light serves the fish in many different ways. One could be communication with fellow species members. It could help to lure prey towards the fish and also to recognize either friend or foe. Every species has its own rhythms and patterns, may be also used as a deterrent. Spooky and beautiful at the same time, a deep sea squid goes on the defensive. And also a deep sea octopus. Surprised by the submarine, this squid emits white ink. Many cephalopods down here have very large eyes. With its large visual organs, this glass squid can detect the smallest sources of light, a crucial skill in this realm of darkness. The animal looks as though it's made of glass. It's completely transparent except for a little bit of pigmentation around the arms and the black eyes. It allows us to look inside the body of this creature. It's a world of curiosities here in the depths off Cape Hatteras, where the Gulf Stream stirs things up. And so the jellyfish drift through the oceans, beautiful and mysterious at the same time. The famous Tiffany jeweler was so fascinated by their beauty and shape that he referred to them as the elves of the ocean. <laughs>